All right, greetings and hello, everybody. My name is David Monroe. I'm Kaylin Bruce. And today we'll be discussing multi-systemic therapy for use with adolescents uh, experiencing antisocial conduct disorder spectrum of problems. All right. MST is a systems approach uh, way of looking at therapy in which you don't work with the client individually like you do in a lot of other therapies. Instead, you work with the family system and every aspect of their environment from the ground up. For example, with MST, um, you will go in, you will speak to the individual, you will speak to the family, you will speak to the school, you will speak to any um, social service system that they're currently involved with, um, and you will even get into their peer groups. Uh, the main goal is to put in as much therapy at every level of the environment so that it generalizes well and helps resolve problems at every, at every level for every dynamic. When providing MST, there's a lot of avenues that individuals can take to employ your services. Sometimes you'll get them through the juvenile justice system, other times through the school system. Sometimes the parents will just be concerned enough to bring the children in themselves. Regardless of the way this happens, there's a couple things you need to know about the population you're working with. A lot of the individuals who suffer from things, uh, from symptomologies along the oppositional defiant conduct disorder, antisocial personality disorder, spectrum of behaviors, is they, they share a lot of commonalities in their past. Um, most of them come from low socioeconomic status, uh, they usually didn't complete much school, most times they come from a broken home, a lot of the times there will be abuse that is present in the house of the child, sometimes there will be substance use disorders happening with the child or with the parents. Regardless of what's going on, a lot of the times there is a lot of lack of structure in the lives. There's no role model present to teach them how to be a socially acceptable individual and exhibit behaviors that don't get them into trouble by breaking the norm. Because there's no guidance for role models in these kids' life, uh, a lot of the times they can get into trouble with things that might be just their way of filling time. Um, sometimes when kids are out there vandalizing property, um, getting in fights, other things along this nature. It's just because it's, it's ways they can hang out with their friends, that they can do something that they think is cool. And without an adult figure present to tell them it's probably not a good idea, they just go, up on, uh, uh, they just go on about their behavior with no consequences until they're picked up by the police or something along that nature. Sometimes the behavior exhibited by the youth will be ways of garnering attention from their parental figures. If they come from a large home and there's a lot of siblings that are fighting over attention, sometimes breaking into the neighbor's house is all it takes to get mom and dad to pay a little bit more attention to you and a little bit less attention to your younger brother. When looking at it this way, it's very easy to see that these are healthy children that have good adaptive skills or just being used in the wrong way, mostly because they haven't been guided down the correct path that is socially acceptable. Alright, so I'm going to be talking to you about the process of therapy using MST. With MST, what you'll have is it'll be a group of counselors, clinicians, social workers, individuals of the sort. Um, usually it'll be one case manager and three to five other clinicians involved with the matter. What will happen is the case manager will look at the case as a whole and divvy up responsibilities throughout the counselors. One counselor is going to go and work on mom and dad. One counselor is going to go work on the kiddo. Another counselor is going to go talk to the school. It's happening so the entire process is happening simultaneously. There's not, we have to fix this and we have to fix this and we have to fix this. It's implementing change at all levels at once. That way there's no real fight back from any one source of the individual's environment. So, in MST, uh, what will happen since you're working with the system is you're going to take the whole family in and you're going to kind of do an assessment over the family process. Usually, children experiencing conduct disorder, antisocial personality disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, any flavor of these diagnoses, if you will, there seems to be an issue within the child's life. Uh, the child is not a bad child. The child is not stupid. It's not wrong. It's not broken. The fact of the matter is the child is actually functioning the best it possibly can in an environment that's broken. Although its behavior seems maladaptive, the child is actually adapting the only possible way to sustain life in its current condition. Uh, because of this, what you need to do is you need to look at all the aspects of the environment that are breeding these maladaptive behaviors that are causing these problems to circumvent.
So when you're looking at the maladaptive behaviors or the problem behaviors, the areas of interest, you're going to try and trace it back to a source. For example, if you have a 14-year-old kid that's getting in fights at school, um, staying out late, getting in fights, getting drunk with his friends, you know, all problematic behaviors for a 14-year-old to have. What you might do is you might start look at the start by looking at the family system. Maybe you notice that mom and dad aren't getting along so great. Their marriage is on the rocks. They're falling apart. The only way that the two of them ever unite is to discipline their child. Maybe the child is not necessarily a bad kid. Maybe he's not doing all these bad things because he wants to, more or less because he's trying to find something to keep mom and dad together. In this way, the maladaptive behavior that we're seeing is actually a highly adaptive behavior that's trying to preserve his way of life in the most in the safest fashion imaginable. So, when you look at a problem like that, when you see there's an issue with mom or with dad, maybe mom stays out too late drinking, maybe dad has a gambling problem, regardless of the issue or the context, the problems can still exist outside the identified patient, the child with conduct disorder. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a step back, we're going to look at that environment, we're going to find areas in which we can intervene that will help change come all the way down through the system. So when you're working in the system, um, maybe let's take dad for example as part of the problem in the system. Let's say dad has a drinking problem and we relate his drinking back to a problem with depression that he has. So the first step of the therapeutic process in setting up the environment for the child would be to work on dad's drinking problem. We can get dad to, an healthy, to a healthy state to be the stereotypical responsible parent that we're expecting that the child needs as a role model in their life, then we'll see that dad can implement changes that will have long-lasting effects on the child. When the parenting style changes, maybe the behavior will change. Through that, we will be delivering things like CBT, um, through cognitive thought restructuring, maybe some behavioral activation, just anything we can to get dad's behavior to change and to get the depression to dissipate from the system. A lot of times what you'll do is you'll make a behavioral contract with the child and the parents. The behavioral contract is basically there to state that the child will not commit behaviors A, B, C, or D. And if they don't, then they will be rewarded with A, B, or C. Uh, basically, it's just a way that there's public, permanent product that everybody has agreed to, all the rules are made, everybody knows exactly what's going to happen. There's no surprises left in the system. Dad and mom can't get mad at the kid if he's doing exactly what he was supposed to do. If he breaks the rules, however, he has to face the consequences they agreed on beforehand. Once a behavioral contract is in place, then we can start to implement changes on the child's behavior in such a way that will help reduce some of the problems he's having in social interactions. Another important part of the treatment process is looking at peer relations in the child. A lot of the times when you take a child in for counseling services, what will happen is you can do a lot of work, you can get a lot of change, but it's only going to be within the context of the laboratory, of the clinician's office, or in the home setting. There's no generalizability, mostly because the kid can get out of the house, get back around his friends, and go back to his old ways. The friends being a bad source, they might be just like he is, they might be acting in a similar way, and because nobody's trying to manipulate their behavior, trying to change their behavior, there's nothing you can really do in order to decrease it. So instead of decreasing their behavior, the intention then becomes to get the child away from the problematic situation. One common step that people delivering MST services usually engage in is to enroll the children in recreational activities. This takes up a lot of their free time where they might have been out roaming the streets with their friends getting into trouble. Now they're in a structured environment. It's providing all the structure and guidance that they need in order to exhibit behaviors that are more along the social norm. Um, and a lot of these times you can get them just playing sports, you can get them involved in volunteer opportunities, just involved in the activity in order to keep an eye on the youth and still provide the structure that they need to thrive. I'm going to talk about the nine core treatment principles uh, within MST. Um, these nine core treatment principles 
are the key to guide treatment planning. Because the clinical problems that you face um, within MST, there needs to be flexibility within the design and delivery of the interventions. MST therapists are to adhere to the nine core treatment principles. High adherence to these treatment principles equals favorable long-term outcomes for violent chronic juvenile offenders. Poor adherence predicts high rates of rearrest and incarcerations in chronic juvenile offenders that are seen within MST. These nine core treatment principles help the therapist to identify the problem, effectively treat the problem by coming up with interventions that are suitable to the child, to the family, and to all systems that the problem behavior affects. It also helps the therapist and the child to come, over, come up with overarching goals and then intermediate goals that are to be met weekly. These goals help the therapist and child track progress and helps the child realize that they're making progress and is, this supports them in a positive way and keeps them wanting to strive and get better within the system's context. Within MST, the child is embedded with multiple interconnected systems. These systems are family, extended family, social network of friends, school, neighborhood, um, the juvenile justice and child welfare system, um, and also other mental health systems. When assessing and identifying problems, the clinician has to consider the reciprocal and the bi-directional nature of the influences between the youth and each system that the behavior affects. For the treatment to be effective, the risk factors across these systems must be identified and addressed. This is done by using these nine core principles, especially the first principle of finding the fit, which helps you identify the problem and effectively look at solutions to how we're going to come up with interventions to address the problem. I'm going to talk about some conceptual assumptions within MST. One conceptual assumption is all youth's antisocial behavior is affected by every system and level of the youth's life. Another assumption that MST makes is that all interventions assess and address potential, potential risk factors in a comprehensive and individualized way. Focusing clinical attention on developing the caregiver's ability to parent effectively and strengthening the family's support system, treatment gains are more likely to be maintained. MST incorporates empirically based treatments. This might include CBT, behavior therapies, behavioral parent training, pragmatic family therapy, and certain pharmacological interventions that have reasonable evidence base. Because MST views the caregiver as the key to achieving long-term clinical outcomes, the interventions would be delivered by the caregiver with consultation of the therapist. This allows for the most effective treatment and allows for change to take hold in a more natural setting. Within MST, treatment fidelity is needed to achieve desired outcomes within the therapy itself. And the last conceptual assumption is that MST has intensive quality assurance protocols built into the program. These include training and monitoring components. Principle one is finding the fit. The primary purpose of assessment is to find out what's going on in that child's world and why the behavior is occurring. This is done through the first principle 
um, of MST. The therapist, child, and caregiver together identify problems and their broader systemic context and how identified problems make sense within every system of the child's life. An example of finding the fit could be a teen who's been smoking marijuana. Now, this is a, a behavior that's been caused by something. So let's say the marijuana smoking was because there's no parental boundaries. Well, then there's no parental boundaries because mom has two or three jobs and it isn't home to enforce those parental boundaries. So marijuana smoking and no parental boundaries leads the youth to hanging out with peers who abuse drugs too. These peer relations leads to having trouble in school and skipping classes with friends, which this leads to eventually getting in trouble with uh, law enforcement. The second principle within MST is positive and strength focused. Within this principle, therapists emphasize what the youth or the families are doing well. Emphasizing the child or youth's and the family's strengths gives them, empowers them, and has many advantages. These advantages are it decreases negative affect, uh, builds feelings of hope, identifies protective factors, um, decreases frustration by emphasizing problem solving, enhances caregiver's confidence. Um, an example of this would be that your family has a good support system or the child or youth family has a good support system of extended family. Or maybe within their neighborhood, they have some reliable neighbors that could help them out and, and help them out with things that they need and problems in situations that might arise within their life. The third principle within MST is increasing responsibility. Interventions within this principle promote responsible behavior and give the youth a sense of ownership while also decreasing irresponsible, beha irresponsible behavior among family members. An example of this could be maybe one of the parents is undermining the other parent's ways of setting boundaries and um, applying consequences to the youth's behavior and the parent points this out with the help of the therapist to show the other parent how this is irresponsible. The fourth principle is present focus, action oriented, and well defined. Present focus is when the therapist is trying to help the youth realize that what happens now is a central point within the therapy process. Problems are defined specifically so that anyone would be able to know what the problem was and how it has affected the other systems within the youth's life. This allows treatment participants to measure progress of treatment and provide clear criteria for, criteria for goals to be met. It allows family members to work towards goals versus gaining insight or focusing on the past. Clear goals delineate criteria, criteria for treatment termination. The fifth principle is targeting sequences. Within this principle, interventions target sequences of behavior within and between systems that maintain identified behavior. So basically, the therapist is helping the client or helping the youth and caregivers identify behaviors that affect multiple systems within the life of the youth. Within this principle, treatment is aimed at changing family interactions that promote responsible behavior and help with pro-social support systems. 
The sixth principle is developmentally appropriate. Within this principle, a developmental emphasis is building youth competencies in peer relations, acquiring academic skills, and vocational skills. This will help the youth in turn have a more successful life and be ready for adulthood once that time comes. Because the youth has gained these new skills, it decreases the likelihood of rearrests because there is no reason for them to go out and to partake in maladaptive behaviors when they are successful people who have newfound skills that help them cope with behaviors that they couldn't cope with before. The seventh principle is continuous effort. Interventions within this principle are designed to initiate and engage the family and youth and require daily and weekly uh, participation. There are some advantages to intensive and multifaceted efforts to change. These advantages are more rapid problem resolution, earlier identification of treatment non-adherence, continuous evaluation of outcomes, more frequent corrective interventions, more opportunities to experience success, and family empowerment as members coordinate their own changes. The eighth principle is evaluation and accountability. Intervention effectiveness is continually monitored from multiple perspectives. The MST team assumes accountability to overcome barriers to treatment. MST therapists do not label families as resistant, not ready to change, or unmotivated to avoid placing blame on the family. This places responsibility for positive treatment outcomes on the MST team. The ninth and final principle of MST is generalization. Interventions are designed to promote treatment effectiveness across all areas of the youth's life. This generalization and long-term maintenance is the key to maintaining the therapeutic change. This is done by empowering caregivers to address family members' needs across multiple systems and contexts within the whole system of MST. Within MST, the caregiver is viewed as the key long-term success. The caregivers are the ones who make most of the changes within MST, with the therapist just guiding them and acting as consultants, advisors, and advocates to guide the family members through the process of change. Interventions are designed to be consistent with the nine core principles of MST, to be empirically based when possible, and to emphasize behavior change in the natural, in the natural environment, empowering caregivers and youth. Engagement and assessment begin with meeting family and youth to explain the MST philosophies and principles. The therapist is more closely aligned with caregivers than the youth, and this is seen as a critical process within therapy. This is seen as critical because in all reality, the caregiver is going to be the one who is engaging the youth in the interventions, with the therapist just being there as a guide. Each family member tells their perspective of the problems and their goals for treatment. The therapist gathers information that is obtained about the family, other people that might be living within the home, extended family, family supports, 
and quality of important relationships that the family has. Guided by this information, the therapist meets with other agencies and individuals and organizations to gain their perspective about problem behaviors that might be happening or going on within that context. The therapist meets with these organizations and individuals to gain their perspective of the behavior. Each system is evaluated for strengths and weaknesses and is incorporated into the treatment plan. Hypotheses are then generated that might concern factors that facilitate goal achievement, barriers to progress, and that might maintain negative behaviors. Then these are tested and established as the baseline for intervention. The MST therapist chooses specific parenting interventions with the help of the MST supervisor and the expert consultant. The assessment of the fit of the particular problem to be addressed and the process of implementation are seen as pivotal points within this process. In a supportive and non-blaming way, MST therapists praise positive aspects of parenting while they also identify current parenting practices that might need to be changed and benefit everybody within the system. When looking at interventions within the context of peers, the therapist looks at the peer relations that involves that are involving the youth. They do this by interviewing caregivers, school personnel, siblings, and they also observe the youth. Within this process, the MST therapist is looking for the number of quality relationships that the youth has built over time. The therapist is also looking at the reputations of the peers, the social and academic functioning of their peers, and whether their peers respect their parents and caregivers alike, and whether their peers have respect for others that are in a higher position like teachers and parents, and how this might affect the youth in their context of life. If it is found that the youth is associating with peers who have a negative effect on their life, the therapist helps the parents or the caregiver address this problem in a non-critical way and show the youth the possibility of, the neg of negative consequences that might be coming with these association with peers. Interventions that might be put into place would be system monitoring of the youth to know where they're at and to monitor the parents to know what is going on and where they're at. It also might include um, adults who are in the caregiver's life who are support systems to help monitor and check up on the youth when parents might be at work or when they're, the youth is home alone to check up on them and see if they're there and see what they're doing. This also includes if the peer is not able to be found, these uh, supportive peers uh, of the family will be helping the parents maybe search where the teen hangs out, um, where his social lane is and the avenues and everywhere that he might be hanging out and might be found. If the caregiver and the, the support system can't find the youth, then there could be a possibility that the law enforcement gets involved to try to help and find the youth. Another intervention that might be used is not allowing the youth to have telephone conversations with uh, these peers who are influences or bad influences um, on the child or on the youth. This will help reduce contact with these antisocial peers and will help the youth and caregiver improve in the area of peer relations. 
So within the school context, the therapist is frequently helping develop and collaborate relationships between the youth's caregivers and school personnel. Reasons for this is because a lot of times the therapists see that this relationship between caregiver and school personnel is uh, fractured and stressed um, and there's a lot of conflict within this relationship. So the therapist's goal is to help this relationship out and to help the caregivers build trust with the personnel of the school to effectively help the youth eventually have a more positive school context. When the therapist is doing this, they need to remember to carefully assess the nature of the conflict and to know both sides of the conflict. Um, they need to know what parties are involved and they need to help establish trust within both parties. The therapist often highlights common ground with a goal of setting collaboration uh, with a goal of setting collaborative interaction between the school and caregivers. These positive changes can help the youth avoid previous dis, uh, decisions that might affect the relationships of or might affect the relationship of the caregiver and the school. And it also will help with any perceived or any consequences or negative consequences that might come out of those negative behaviors that happen within the school context. The therapist often makes arrangements in which the parent is responsible for setting up contingencies based on uh, the youth's behavior in school. MST individually oriented interventions always occur in the context of a large systemic treatment. These interventions can be considered or categorized as addressing continued or problematic behaviors after the implementation of systems interventions. So within the systems, if the problematic behavior is still occurring, then the intervention goes on an individually based um, context. Within the individualized treatments, a lot of times the family is needed to be addressed. Um, sometimes mom and dad have problems too. And for real change to happen within the youth, the family problems need to be addressed so there's a stable environment for the youth to return to at home. Um, within these interventions that are uh, specifically designed for the youth or the caregivers, CBT is frequently used um, within this context because it's empirically supported um, for anxiety, depression, and externalizing conditions. Um, the evidence is relatively strong. CBT is also consistent with MST in that it is present focused and action oriented. It's also individualized to the developmental level of the person receiving therapy. CBT is also evaluated from multiple perspectives and it provides a skill that potentially is generalizable um, upon the finish of the therapy. Within MST, sometimes the therapist is going to have to do or know about psychiatric interventions. Um, the therapist must be familiar with and able to recognize youth and adult conditions that may respond to psychiatric medications. Um, ADHD is comorbid with um, a lot of these disorders that the MST therapist um, is confronted with within this population of kids they work with. When ADHD is um, seen with conduct disorder, um, this association is seen as more negative or within this association there's more negative outcomes 
um, than just conduct disorder or ADHD or ADHD alone. If the MST team feels that there are symptoms that are consistent with ADHD and these symptoms are interfering with uh, goal achievement within the therapy process, the MST therapist might need to think about possibly um, using some type of stimulant um, on a trial basis. When this is done, the MST team and the therapists within this team need to realize that they might need to seek um, child and adolescent psychiatrists who are systems oriented and who are well versed um, in empirically supported literature and research and treatments. If the MST team decides to seek out a psychiatrist um, to help with these problems, um, the therapist's role within this is to have a positive working relationship with a psychiatrist and to be a support system for the youth and family to help them follow through with appointments and with medications. There are several things that the therapist needs to consider when treating a family and social supports and providing interventions within this context. Um, a major goal of MST is to develop and maintain social supports for the youth and family um, and this promotes sustainable treatment goals. Assessment of family social supports occurs during the assessment of other youth involve systems. Social supports can be characterized by the type of uh, support. Um, it could be an instrumental support, an emotional support, um, appraisal, um, and informational. And also um, this is on a continuum ranging from informal to proximal relationships to um, more relationships that are distal um, then that also goes into professional relationships and then into even broader context of formal systems. So for interventions within the family and social support, the therapist, um, the therapist's preference is to develop um, more proximal and informal supports. The reason for this is because these are more likely to be responsive, accessible, and maintained over time. To maintain long-term uh, informal social supports, families who receive support must reciprocate that support. Um, an example of this might be, let's say you have a neighbor who you ask to check up on your uh, son or daughter after school. Because this neighbor does this for you, you in return uh, once a week mow their lawn for them. This is seen as they're helping you out, but you are also reciprocate, reciprocating that um, and showing that by helping them out by mowing their lawn. Within MST, treatment termination usually ends in one of two ways. Either the goals are met with mutual agreement between the therapist, the family, and all stakeholders that have um, a claim within the context of the child's life or the youth's life. Um, that's one way. The second way is usually that uh, the goals are unmet and it is felt that treatment has reached a diminishing or reached a certain point where there's not going to be any return for the time invested in trying to uh, give the youth and family interventions. Within MST, approximately two thirds of all MST cases in community settings end up being successful. With this success, um, it means that all stakeholders are in agreement that the therapy has had positive change within the life and the family has maintained those positive gains. 
In the latter stages of MST, um, it is spent preparing the youth and the family and all the stakeholders within the system for the withdrawal of the MST services. This includes the eventual termination um, of the service and this is discussed openly with the family and everybody that's involved, all the stakeholders, um, with the therapist um, explaining and guiding in this area. At the, em at the end of treatment process, um, care caregiver competence is highlighted and mechanisms uh, for maintaining progress are discussed. If the therapist or family um, feel like there might be a need for further services, the therapist um, refers the family to the appropriate um, place of where they can find help that will appropriately, appropriately address the problem. But within the MST um, termination process, uh, most MST therapists do not assume that the family is going to need further services beyond this um, four to five month process. So thanks for stopping by and watching our video today. We hope you really enjoyed it and it was really informative about MST. If you'd like to know more about MST, just Google MST and you can find a lot of cool things online.